My wife? Emily's eyes sparkled as she waved a glossy brochure. The pamphlet showcased a lavish new resort nestled along the California coast. Skepticism crept in as I imagined the price tag, but she explained that her agency was handling the resort's publicity and we could attend for free. She said it might be a great way to reconnect and strengthen our relationship. I was hesitant at first since there was a soccer match I wanted to watch that Saturday. But after thinking it over, I realized it was probably a good idea. Our eight-year marriage had been strained lately, largely due to issues with my construction business and recent financial troubles, which had even forced us to sell our house. With things finally looking up in my business, this seemed like a much-needed break. Emily, a vice president at a prominent PR firm in San Diego, had really been the one keeping us afloat during the tough times. But her rising success meant long hours, late nights, and less time for us, putting extra strain on our marriage. It felt like we had lost some of the intimacy we once shared. We packed on Wednesday and left early Thursday morning, heading to Clearwater Bay Resort. Its remote location surprised me, but the luxury of the place impressed me even more. Emily pointed out that the resort catered to wealthy alumni from UC Berkeley, and our Ocean View suite really showed off her PR skills. After unpacking, we enjoyed mojitos and joked about how we'd need to build even more to afford a place like this ourselves. While Emily went for a massage at the spa, I swam laps in the pool. Later, after a nap, we got ready for dinner. But the restaurant we wanted to go to was fully booked. Just as we were about to head to another spot, a man at a nearby table waved us over. I noticed you were looking for a seat, he said as he approached. I'm Brad Thompson, and this is my wife, Laura. If you don't mind dining with strangers, we'd be happy to have you join us. I glanced at Emily, and she smiled. So I shook his hand. I'm Jack, and this is my wife, Emily. We'd be happy to join you. As we moved to their table, I sized them up. Brad was about my height and probably a few years older than both of us. His wife, Laura, wasn't just a typical trophy wife. She was certainly attractive, with a confident demeanor that drew attention. She was well-dressed, and her air of self-assurance made it clear she was used to turning heads. We got to know each other quickly, sharing stories about the resort and our lives. Brad and Laura had just arrived from Fresno, and we gave them some recommendations about the place. The conversation flowed easily, and before we knew it, dessert was being served. Brad insisted on ordering after-dinner drinks, and as we raised our glasses, he proposed a toast to new friends in unexpected places. Once we were finished, Brad wasn't ready to call it a night. I hear there's a nightclub here that's supposed to be great. How about a dance or two? Emily smiled at me, and I nodded. Sounds good, Brad. The nightclub was crowded when we arrived, but Brad must have had connections because a table opened up for us almost immediately. After we ordered drinks, Brad stood up and asked, Mind if I take your wife for a dance? Only if I can dance with yours, I replied, and Laura gave me an approving smile. The band was playing some classic rock, and we all danced a couple of songs before swapping partners. By the time we returned to our table, I leaned over to Emily and asked, Ready to head back? We've got some unfinished business in our room, she replied with a wink. We said our goodbyes to Brad and Laura. Brad and I exchanged a friendly handshake, and I noticed Laura's hug lingered just a bit longer than expected, but I didn't mind. Just as we were about to leave, Brad called out, Hey, why don't you two join us for brunch tomorrow at 11? We're staying in one of the beach cottages. I think you'd enjoy it. I looked at Emily who whispered, I'm really liking Brad and Laura. Plus, I'd love to check out one of those cottages. Sure, I replied. We'll see you tomorrow. As we got into the elevator, Emily turned to me with a playful smile. So, what did you think of Laura? She seemed nice, I said, trying to keep it simple, but Emily wasn't buying it. Nice, huh? You couldn't stop staring at her chest, she teased. I tried to protest, but she just laughed. Well, I think it's time you paid some attention to me instead, she said, gesturing toward herself. They might not be as big as hers, but I think you'll appreciate them if you give them a little kiss. That was all the encouragement I needed and we enjoyed a night of intimacy that we hadn't shared in a while. The next morning, we visited Brad and Laura's beach cottage for an incredible brunch on their patio, with the cool ocean breeze making everything perfect. While Emily and Laura decided to lounge by the infinity pool, 
Brad invited me out on a fishing trip aboard his 38-foot boat. Though I didn't have much experience with deep-sea fishing, I agreed to join him. Brad packed a cooler with beer, and I helped carry some gear. A few miles out in the Pacific, we started trolling. The fish weren't biting much, but the cold drinks and relaxing atmosphere made up for it. Brad shared stories about his wealth, and I couldn't help but be impressed by how successful they were. Suddenly, my rod jerked violently, and Brad helped me reel in what felt like a heavy catch. As he maneuvered the boat, he pointed out something in the water, a shark. It jumped out of the water several times as I struggled to pull it in, but eventually, it bit through the line and got away. Brad tried to comfort me, saying losing a big fish like that was part of the game, but I was honestly relieved to avoid more of a confrontation with the beast. By the time we returned to the resort, I was exhausted but excited to share the adventure with Emily. She was impressed, just as I had hoped. I sensed something was on Emily's mind as soon as I finished telling her about my fishing adventure. She had that familiar look, waiting for the right moment to speak. Finally, she broke the silence. I had quite an interesting day too, she said, her expression hard to read. Curious, I raised an eyebrow, prompting her to continue. Laura and I had a very revealing conversation by the pool. She mentioned that she and Brad are into swinging. I stared at her, confused. Swinging? What do they like to swing, exactly? Emily sighed and gave me a look that said I was being naive. No, Jack. They swap partners in bed. Oh, I muttered as the realization sank in. Wow, I didn't see that coming. There's more, Emily said, a sly smile creeping across her face. Laura asked if we'd be interested in joining them tonight. I sat down on the edge of the bed, overwhelmed. We had only just met these people, and now this? Laura was definitely attractive, but I thought this trip was about reconnecting with Emily, not complicating things. I don't know, honey. I started, trying to gather my thoughts. I like them, but this feels a little rushed. What do you think? Emily sat beside me, her hand resting on mine. I think we should go for it. We've talked about experimenting before, and this feels like a perfect opportunity. We don't really know them that well, and they live in another state. It's not like we'll run into them again. Plus, Laura is gorgeous. The image of Laura in her swimwear from earlier that day popped into my mind, making the idea more tempting, but I still needed to be sure Emily was comfortable with it. Are you positive? I asked, squeezing her hands. We're having a great weekend, and I'm more than happy to keep my attention on just you. Emily smiled warmly. Let's do it. It'll be an adventure, and if it doesn't work out, we never have to do it again. Her certainty, along with my own growing attraction to Laura, pushed me toward agreeing. I masked my excitement and nodded. At dinner with Brad and Laura, the atmosphere was charged with anticipation. Emily wore a striking red dress that clung to her figure, while Laura was stunning in black her touch on my knee sending electric signals through my body. I could tell from the glances exchanged between Emily and Brad that they were having similar moments. After dinner, when the women suggested dancing, Brad and I reluctantly agreed. As the slow jazz played, the dancing became more intimate. Laura pressed herself against me, her touch now impossible to ignore, and across the dance floor, I saw Emily and Brad in a similar embrace. When the women went to freshen up, Brad slipped me his keycard. You and Laura can use our cottage tonight. Emily and I will stay in yours, he said with a wink. I nodded, my pulse quickening at the thought. When Laura and I returned to their beach cottage, things escalated quickly. She led me to the bedroom, her hands eager as she undressed me. Afterward, as I lay there catching my breath, I realized she had curled up beside me. I turned and kissed her gently, still reeling from the intensity of the moment. That was amazing, I admitted, surprised by how good it had felt. Laura smiled seductively. Come on, big guy, she said, positioning herself. Let's see what else you've got. The next thing I knew, it was morning, and Laura was waking me up, reminding me not to miss breakfast. Groggy and a little disoriented, I got dressed, and we walked together to the restaurant. Laura complimented me on the night before, but as much as I appreciated it, I was starting to feel uneasy. I needed to see Emily and talk to her about what happened. When we arrived, Emily and Brad were already seated. 
Emily greeted me with a bright smile and told me she had ordered breakfast for me. I hesitated before sitting down, asking her if everything was okay. Everything's fine, she said with a reassuring look. How was your night? It was good, I replied cautiously. We should talk about it later. She nodded, but before I could say more, she urged me to eat. You look exhausted. Get some food in you first. As we ate, the conversation turned to plans for the day. Laura suggested taking us out on their boat for a ride, though Brad couldn't come because of a conference call. He assured us that Laura was more than capable of handling the boat on her own. The perfect weather made the idea of a boat ride appealing, and the thought of spending the day with two women in bikinis didn't sound bad either. Emily and I headed back to our room to change, but as we packed up our beach gear, I found myself growing more and more tired. Emily noticed my yawning and suggested, Why don't you take a quick nap? I'll go ahead with Laura, and we can meet up later. I didn't resist. I collapsed onto the bed, and before I knew it, Emily had kissed me on the cheek, left a do not disturb sign on the door, and was out the door with Laura. I passed out almost instantly. What felt like moments later, I was jolted awake by loud knocking and frantic voices. Groggily, I looked at the clock. It was already 4 p.m., and I was shocked at how late it had gotten. The knocking persisted, and I stumbled to the door, finding a hotel staff member looking alarmed. We've been searching for you, he said urgently. There's been an accident. Confused and still half asleep, I followed him to the elevator, where he insisted I come right away. Outside, a group of uniformed men were waiting. A Coast Guard officer pointed toward a helicopter hovering over smoke rising from the gulf. Another officer showed me a live feed of wreckage drifting in the water, explaining that there had been an explosion and fire. My heart dropped. What kind of boat was it? I asked, my voice shaking. The officer replied, it appears to have been a Chris Craft cruiser. I felt my legs go weak. Have you found any survivors? I whispered, barely able to get the words out. He looked at me with a somber expression. The helicopter hasn't spotted any life vests, and the diver they sent down hasn't found any bodies in the water. Noticing my reaction, he added, but a boat from the Marine Safety Office in Miami is on its way. They'll be able to do a more detailed search. An image of the shark I had seen earlier flashed in my mind, and I shuddered, trying to push it away. What could have caused the explosion? I asked, pointing at the live feed from the helicopter. The officer shook his head. We often see this when engine fumes build up and someone tries to restart the motor. An explosion can happen in an instant. It's a tragic but common occurrence among boaters. Just then, his radio crackled to life, and he responded quickly. He turned back to me, saying, their cruiser is continuing the search. There's nothing more you can do right now. Why don't you head back to your room? We'll let you know if there's any news. Reluctantly, I made my way back inside. As I walked through the lobby, I overheard someone whispering, poor guy, which only deepened the pit of despair growing inside me. If the professionals were losing hope, what chance did I have? The afternoon dragged on, each minute feeling like an eternity as I waited for the call I desperately needed. I tried to stay busy by contacting my office, my sister, and Emily's parents, but each conversation was more painful than the last. Later, a waiter brought food sent by the hotel manager, but I had no appetite. I barely touched it. As night fell, I found myself staring out at the dark ocean, hoping for some sign, anything, that Emily might still be alive. Sleep was impossible. I busied myself by packing our bags, trying to keep my hands and mind occupied. When I found a pair of Emily's underwear under the bed, it hit me like a punch to the gut. They were from last night. I was overwhelmed with guilt as I realized that I had spent Emily's last night alive in the arms of another woman, Laura, who might also be gone now. Resentment boiled up inside me. If it hadn't been for Laura tiring me out, I might have been on the boat with Emily maybe even able to help. My thoughts turned to Brad, who was likely going through the same torment. I collapsed onto the bed, consumed by grief, guilt, and rage. It was the worst night of my life. As I lay there, memories of my time with Emily flooded back. We had met on campus at the University of California, both of us on soccer scholarships. We became inseparable almost immediately, 
dating all through college and getting married right after graduation. Her parents' story was one of resilience. Her father's family had lost their farm in Cuba after Castro came to power, and they had fled to Miami. Her mother had grown up in poverty, but both of her parents worked tirelessly to give Emily the best education they could. She had vowed never to struggle financially like her family had, and she supported me during the roughest times, including when the recession nearly bankrupted my construction business. I couldn't shake the fear that I might never get the chance to tell her how much I loved her, how grateful I was for everything she had done. As the first light of dawn crept through the window, I found myself whispering childhood prayers, hoping for a miracle. At some point, I must have drifted off because I was suddenly startled awake by a loud knock at the door. A Coast Guard officer stood in the hallway, and I knew from his expression that it wasn't good news. We're calling off the search for survivors, he said quietly. We've used all of our equipment through the night, but given the severity of the explosion, the chances of finding anyone alive are slim. I wanted to scream, to beg them to keep looking, but all I could do was stare at the floor. Finally, I managed to mutter, Thank you, officer. I know you did everything you could. He nodded, shook my hand, and turned to leave. The door closed, and I crumpled onto the floor, my body shaking with grief. I don't know how long I lay there, lost in sorrow, but another knock on the door roused me again. This time, two uniformed men stood outside. Mr. Turner, one of them asked. I nodded, confirming my name. I'm Detective Larson, and this is my partner from the Citrus County Sheriff's Department. We need to talk to you about the incident yesterday. Sighing, I stepped back and let them in. The last thing I wanted to deal with was an investigation, but I knew it was necessary. We sat down in the small living area of the suite, and the detective started with his questions. Where were you when the incident occurred? I found the use of the word incident unsettling, but I replied calmly, I was in my room from breakfast until about 4 p.m., that's a long time, he remarked. What were you doing in your room all that time? Napping, I replied, irritation creeping into my voice. I was tired from the night before. The detective smirked. You must have really worn yourself out, huh? I didn't respond, just stared back at him. Did anyone see you while you were in your room? He continued, his tone dripping with sarcasm. No, I was asleep, I said, keeping my composure. So. There's no one who can confirm your whereabouts between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., he said, stretching out my last name in a way that felt patronizing. That condescending tone hit a nerve. It reminded me of old prejudices I had faced growing up. Even though South Florida had a large Latino population, once you moved north, especially into the rural parts, you could still run into outdated attitudes. But I kept my temper in check. I had to accept it. What's going on here? My wife just died in a tragic accident, and now you're treating me like I'm some sort of criminal suspect, I said, my anger rising. You're the one who mentioned crime, senor, the other deputy replied smugly. That was it. Officers, I'm fully aware of my rights, and I won't be answering any more questions without my lawyer present, I said firmly, trying to stay composed. The two men exchanged glances before the first officer closed his notebook. I suppose you know how this looks, Senor Turner. It looks like an American citizen exercising his constitutional rights. I shot back. He shrugged, and the deputies headed for the door. Very well. We'll expect you and your lawyer at the Citrus County Sheriff's Office in Inverness tomorrow morning, the officer said before leaving. I stood there for a moment, trying to collect myself. Then, I grabbed the phone and called my attorney, Jose Pascal, in Orlando. His secretary recognized my name and immediately transferred me to him. Jack, Jose said when he answered, his voice filled with sympathy. We were all shocked by the news. Please accept my deepest condolences for the loss of your wife. It doesn't take long for bad news to spread, I muttered. That's why I'm calling, Jose. I'm still at the Clearwater Bay Resort, and two local deputies just questioned me as if I were a suspect. I'm in unfamiliar territory here and need legal help fast. Jose paused before replying, I'm sure this is just a misunderstanding, but we should get someone local who knows the courts around there, just in case. Let me make a few calls and get back to you. I thanked him, sank into a chair, and rubbed my temples as the pounding in my head grew worse. 
This nightmare kept spiraling. About an hour later, the phone rang, and I answered quickly. It was Jose again. I've got some good news and some bad news, he began. Let's start with the bad. How well do you know Brad and Laura Thompson? We only met them this weekend, I replied uneasily. Well, Laura's real name is Mia Reynolds. Her father is one of the wealthiest and most powerful men in Marion County. He owns the largest thoroughbred horse farm in Ocala. The problem is that none of the major law firms in Central Florida will take your case because they all owe favors to Mr. Reynolds. Damn it, I muttered, frustration bubbling. So, what do I do? The good news is I found a lawyer in Inverness who can represent you. Her name is Gina Ellerby. She's relatively young and inexperienced, but she comes highly recommended by the locals. I sighed. If you think she can handle the situation here, then I'll trust your judgment. I do, Jose said. I've already reached out to her office, and she'll meet you at the resort tomorrow morning. You can go together to meet with the sheriff's department. I'm confident you'll get through this with her help. He paused, his tone softening. Jack, I'm truly sorry for your loss. If there's anything else I can do, please let me know. Thank you, Jose, I said, my voice shaking. Even talking about Emily's death felt like reopening a wound. Later, the resort management called, offering me an extra night stay if needed. I thanked them for their kindness, though the idea of staying longer felt unbearable. Afterward, I called my office to check on the ongoing projects. Despite my grief, I couldn't neglect my responsibilities. Once I was caught up, I spent the rest of the afternoon arranging a memorial service for Emily. It was a painful task, but I felt it was something I owed to her, her family, and our friends. By the time evening came, I was emotionally drained. Another sleepless night followed as I struggled to come to terms with everything that had happened. The next morning, after a quick breakfast, I waited in my room for my new attorney to arrive. A soft knock interrupted my thoughts, and when I opened the door, a young woman stood there. Good morning, Mr. Turner, she said, offering her hand. I'm Gina Ellerby, your attorney. As she stepped into the room, I couldn't help but stare. Jose had mentioned she was young, but she looked like she could have just finished high school. She was attractive, but reminded me of one of those Disney Channel stars. Noticing my stare, she asked, Is something wrong, Mr. Turner? I felt embarrassed and quickly asked, I don't mean to be rude, but how old are you? Her face flushed slightly as she straightened her posture. I understand that I look younger than my age, and my voice may sound youthful, but I'm 27 years old. I graduated law school, passed the bar exam, and I'm fully licensed to practice in Florida. If that's not acceptable, I can leave, and you can find another attorney. Her words stung, and I immediately raised my hands to apologize. I'm sorry, Miss Ellerby. You just caught me off guard. Let's start over. I'm Jack Turner, but please call me Jack. I'd like you to represent me. She took a deep breath, then shook my hand. Apology accepted, she said with a small smile. You can call me Gina. I'm looking forward to working with you. I'm sorry again, I said, feeling the weight of the past few days. It's been difficult. Gina nodded. Mr. Pascal briefed me but I'd like to hear the details from you personally. I started explaining, Emily and I drove up here on Thursday. Gina interrupted, Jack, I'm really sorry about your wife. I should have expressed my condolences when I arrived. I nodded, appreciating her sympathy, though the words seemed hollow in light of everything. There wasn't much more to say beyond thanking her for the kind words. I gave her a brief overview of the weekend, omitting the details about our plans with Brad and Mia on Saturday night. It felt wrong, especially now. Gina listened carefully, jotting down notes as I spoke. After I finished, it was time to head to the sheriff's office in Inverness. Gina offered to drive, and as we cruised down FL-44, she tried to put my mind at ease. I've already reviewed the Coast Guard's report online, she explained. They've ruled this a boating accident. Today's meeting is likely just to wrap things up. I don't expect any serious trouble. Don't worry, they won't try to pull anything with me there. Her confidence was comforting. It made me feel a little better, but I couldn't shake the unease that had settled over me. Gina seemed to know her stuff, and I liked the way she handled herself. When we arrived at the Inverness Sheriff's Department, I quickly realized this wasn't going to be a simple meeting. 
Sheriff McGee himself was waiting for us, and the tone shifted immediately. He began with the same questions his deputies had asked about my whereabouts on the day of the accident. Admitting I had no proof that I'd been in my room the entire time made me uncomfortable. So, you were napping from 10 o'clock in the morning until nearly 4 o'clock in the afternoon? The sheriff raised an eyebrow. That's a long nap. Must have been one heck of a night before. I squirmed a bit, wishing this topic hadn't come up. We stayed out late at the club, I said. Dancing. He scribbled something in his notebook, his pen moving slowly. And your relationship with your wife, Mr. Turner? His tone made the question feel loaded. Sheriff, we were good, I responded quickly, but I could feel the tension in my voice. Like any couple, we had our ups and downs, but our marriage was strong. Gina shot me a quick, disapproving glance, as if my words weren't landing well. The sheriff tapped his pen against the table, thinking, So, you're saying you were a devoted husband? Yes, of course, I answered, trying not to sound defensive. Then why, Mr. Turner, did staff at the resort see you leaving the nightclub with Mia Thompson instead of your wife? And why did the two of you head back to her cottage and not return until morning? I froze for a second, realizing how bad this looked. Gina's expression mirrored my dread. I had tried to keep certain details private, but now, my silence was only making me look suspicious. I had no choice but to be honest. Sheriff, my wife and I had been talking about trying new things, I began cautiously. When Brad and Mia offered the chance, we decided to explore that idea. It was consensual. I swear. I gave him a summary of what had happened, leaving out the more intimate parts. Please, I added, keep this confidential. I really don't want her family finding out about this. It would destroy them. The sheriff didn't say a word, just made a note before switching topics. Did you and Mrs. Turner have any life insurance policies? I shook my head. No, I've always thought life insurance was a bad investment, so you wouldn't benefit from her passing away unexpectedly? He wasn't letting up. No, I replied, frustration creeping into my voice. What about the accidental death policy her employer provided? He pressed. I paused, realizing I had forgotten about that. Oh, yeah. Felicia mentioned she'd increased it, but I didn't know it was much. The sheriff's eyes narrowed as he jotted something down. Your wife increased her coverage to $1 million just last month. I didn't know it was that much, I said quickly, realizing how weak it sounded. The sheriff continued pressing. Let's talk about Mia Thompson. How long had you known her? This weekend was the first time I met her, I responded, trying to stay calm. Can you prove that? He shot back. Before I could answer, Gina jumped in. Sheriff, you know it's impossible to prove a negative. My client can't prove something that didn't happen. The sheriff looked irritated, his face flushing with annoyance. Now listen here, young lady. But Gina wasn't backing down. Her face hardened, and she stood up her voice steady but firm. Sheriff McGee, I'm an officer of the court. You will either respect my position or I will file formal complaints against you for misconduct. The sheriff, who had been leaning forward, suddenly seemed to shrink back. Though he towered over Gina physically, her confidence threw him off. Despite his size, it was clear that the sheriff wasn't ready to tangle with her. I believe my client has answered enough questions for today, she continued. If you have more, you can schedule another meeting. But unless you plan to charge him with a crime, we're leaving. McGee glared at me before muttering, You're free to go, Mr. Turner, but don't even think about leaving the state. Without another word, Gina grabbed my arm and ushered me out of the sheriff's office. Once we were back on the road, I let out a long breath I didn't realize I had been holding. I glanced at Gina and said, Wow, remind me never to get on your bad side. The way you handle the sheriff, Listen, she interrupted sharply. I'm this close to dropping your case. Don't ever lie to me again about anything. I can't represent you properly if you hide things. Gina, I'm sorry, I said earnestly. I didn't mean to lie. I was just embarrassed about the wife swapping. I didn't want to damage Emily's reputation, or Mia's for that matter. I honestly didn't know about Emily increasing her insurance to a million dollars. Please believe me. She stared straight ahead in silence, processing my words. After a long pause, she finally said, I believe you. 
but don't ever keep things from me again. It'll only hurt your case. Then, softening slightly, she added, Besides, wanting to experiment in your marriage doesn't make you a murderer. I still think this was nothing more than a tragic accident. By the time we arrived back at the resort, she pulled into the parking lot and stopped to let me out. I know you need to head back to Orlando, she said. I'll handle things here, and if anything changes, I'll reach out right away. After checking out of the resort, I began the long drive back to Orlando, unable to stop thinking about what was ahead. The hardest thing, of course, would be Emily's memorial service. It loomed over me like a dark cloud. Two days later, while I was at my office, my phone rang. It was Jose. Jack, have you seen the Sentinel today? He asked, his voice serious. When I told him I hadn't, he advised, you should check the local section, but brace yourself. It's not good. Looks like someone's stirring up trouble. I quickly checked the online edition, and there it was, plastered under breaking news, Orlando man named person of interest in wife's death. The article not only covered the explosion, but was littered with phrases like unexplained absence, possible motive, and bedroom games. My blood boiled as I read through the insinuations. Fuming, I called Gina immediately. The sheriff must have leaked this to the press. They're dragging me through the mud, making wild guesses that make me look like a killer. I shouted, how could he do this? And why isn't Brad Thompson under suspicion? He had more to gain than I did. Forget about Brad, Gina said coolly. He's not a suspect. The sheriff told me he has an airtight alibi with six witnesses. He was on a long conference call during the entire time of the accident. I scoffed, not convinced. That doesn't prove anything. He could have been on a cell phone, anywhere. Andy, the building where he took the call has security cameras, she explained. They have footage showing him entering before the call and leaving after it ended. Plus, the windows in that building are sealed. He couldn't have gone anywhere. Hearing the certainty in her voice, I let out a frustrated groan. Fine, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm being portrayed as the villain here. Gina sighed. Look, I still believe this was just an awful accident. The sheriff might be treating it like a murder investigation because that's his job. Or maybe he's watched too many detective shows. Either way, I'm confident this will be wrapped up soon, and you'll be cleared. Maybe, I muttered, still feeling the sting of the article. But right now, everyone's treating me like a murderer. The days leading up to Emily's memorial were quiet, but the weight of the rumors was unbearable. I dreaded facing the people who might now see me as the prime suspect, but I couldn't avoid it. I owed it to Emily, her family, and our friends. The service was as painful as I expected. The priest's words did little to ease my grief, and the eulogies only made my heart ache more. When it was my turn to speak, I could barely get through the first half of what I had prepared. My emotions overwhelmed me, and I had to stop, choking out a simple, I miss you, Emily, before stepping down. Even though the turnout was decent, I couldn't help but notice that fewer people than expected came to offer their condolences afterward. Instead, many gathered in small clusters, whispering behind their hands. I could only imagine what they were discussing. At one point, I noticed Emily's family standing off to the side. Her father's eyes locked with mine, filled with suspicion, his expression hard and unforgiving. I longed to say something to convince him I had nothing to do with Emily's death. But before I could act, her mother hurried over and wrapped me in a brief but sincere hug. We know you loved her, Jack, she whispered. Once this is all behind us, you should come visit. Her words gave me a moment of relief, but I couldn't help wondering how long it would be until this nightmare finally blew over. The only thing that truly stood out at the service was the presence of my entire soccer team. Seeing them there brought a sense of solidarity that I hadn't expected. The last one to approach me was Domingo, our striker. A guy small in stature, but fast as lightning. He wrapped me in a firm hug. Jack, stay strong, man. We know you didn't do anything wrong. You're like a boy scout. You never even got a red card in all the games we played. His words were meant to comfort me but I felt a cold wave of doubt sweep over me. The people closest to me believed in my innocence, but the rest of the world, that was another matter entirely. I couldn't help but smile at Domingo's words. Thanks, man. 
I just wish everyone else had the same confidence in me. A week after the memorial, I was buried in work when Gina Ellerby unexpectedly walked into my office. Gina? What brings you here? I asked, surprised to see her. I've got some updates for you, she said, setting her bag down. And since things have been slow at my office, I thought I'd come by in person. That is, if you're not too busy. Not at all, I replied, gesturing to a chair. I'm glad you're here. What's going on? Gina sat down and explained that she'd gone back to the sheriff's office to confront him about the Sentinel article. I asked if he'd taken up a side job as a reporter, she said, smirking, but he denied leaking anything. He did admit to recording the interview, though, so someone might have overheard it. That's frustrating, I muttered. I suspect one of the deputies blabbed, but there's nothing I can do now. The damage is done. Unfortunately, when Gina came back a week later, her news wasn't any better. The sheriff's team found something new, she said, her face serious. I could tell from her expression that it wasn't good. The fuel cans from the boat washed ashore, she continued, and your fingerprints are all over them. I sighed in frustration. Of course they are. I helped Don get the boat ready. I carried the extra fuel. Naturally, my prints would be on those cans. I believe you, Andy, she reassured me. But I have to be honest. It doesn't look great. If I were a prosecutor, I'd argue that you had motive, means, and opportunity. Felicia's insurance gives a clear motive, your fingerprints on the cans suggest means, and your lack of an alibi points to opportunity. I shook my head. I've already explained all of that. Does any of it actually prove anything? No, it doesn't. And that's likely why they haven't pressed charges yet. But I've seen cases where circumstantial evidence like this sway juries. Her words hit me like a punch to the gut. This is turning into a nightmare, I muttered. What will it take to clear my name? Gina paced the room, deep in thought. The biggest issue is proving where you were on Sunday. The sheriff's team spoke to every staff member at the resort, but no one recalls seeing you. That's because I was asleep in my room. I exclaimed, my frustration growing. How can I prove that? There must be something we can use, she said, scanning the room as if searching for answers. Then, she stopped. Aren't resort doors controlled by key cards? Couldn't we check the system to see if your door was opened? I shook my head. No, the key cards aren't connected to a central system like that. Each lock is a standalone unit that only accepts a specific code. They're not networked. I paused, then a thought struck me making my heart race. But, newer systems can track entries and exits. Maybe the resort has one of those? It was a long shot, but it was the only idea I had. Without wasting any more time, I called the resort. The manager remembered me, and as I explained my question, I could hear his realization on the other end of the line. The Paradiso is cutting edge in every way, he said, including our card system. Why didn't you mention this earlier? I asked, trying to keep my frustration in check. I've never worked in a hotel with this kind of system before, he admitted. With the preview weekend and the official opening, it slipped my mind. But the system should be operational. He put me on hold for a few minutes before coming back with some hopeful news. You're in luck, Mr. Turner. The system is up and running, and we have all the data from that weekend. Please, keep those records safe, I urged him. We'll be there as soon as possible to review them. Gina and I wasted no time. We jumped in the car and sped up to Crystal River, barely stopping for anything. We were lucky the highway patrol was busy with tourists, or we might have gotten pulled over for speeding. When we finally arrived, the resort manager was waiting for us. He led us to the back office, where he had already printed out the records. Gina and I stared at the stack of papers, struggling to make sense of the columns and rows of data. Each page corresponds to a different day, the manager explained, flipping through the printouts. Here, on the horizontal axis, are the room numbers. The codes in the table show whether a door was opened or closed and if a card key was used. Gina frowned. How can a door be opened without a card key? When someone opens it from the inside, the manager clarified. He flipped to Sunday's records and pointed to one particular line. Here's the log for your room. You can see all the entries and exits. And this, he said, pointing to another line, is for Sunday morning. 
It shows the door was opened from the inside around 8.30 a.m. That's when Emily and I went down for breakfast, I said, feeling a wave of relief wash over me. Gina scanned the sheet with a look of determination. We need to match up every entry and exit with your alibi. This could be exactly what we need. I glanced at Gina, hoping she wouldn't mention Brad Thompson being in the room at the time. The manager continued, Here, you can see that the door was opened with the card key at 9.57 a.m., likely when you returned from breakfast. About 30 minutes later, it opened again without a key, which probably means your wife left the room. He pointed to another line. After that, the door stayed closed until 3.56 p.m. I turned to Gina, frustration bubbling up. But this doesn't prove much, does it? I could have left with Emily at 10.30. Gina, however, was practically buzzing with excitement. Jack, don't you see? If you'd left with her, how could you have gotten back into the room without a key? The fact that the door wasn't opened with a key between 10.30 and 4 o'clock shows you stayed in the room the whole time. It proves your story. My eyes widened, and I couldn't help but pull her into a hug. You're brilliant, Gina, I said, feeling a surge of hope. I turned back to the manager. Can we keep these records? I asked. Of course, he replied, handing us the printed logs he had prepared. I printed them just for you. With the evidence in hand, Gina and I rushed to the sheriff's office in Inverness. We caught Sheriff McGee just as he was heading out the door. Gina waved the papers at him. Sheriff, we've got proof, she called out. She spread the printouts on the hood of his car and began explaining. These logs confirm that Jack was in his room the entire time on Sunday. There's no way he could have left, and this supports his account that the explosion was a tragic accident. The sheriff examined the papers, clearly trying to mask his irritation. I'll review these with the resort manager, he said grudgingly. He nodded to Gina giving her some acknowledgement before driving off. Once he was gone, Gina turned to me, her face beaming. I think we've finally done it, she said, wrapping me in a tight hug. Feeling a sense of relief, I offered to take her to dinner to celebrate. She chose the McLeod House Bistro, a charming century-old restaurant in Inverness. Over dinner, I got to know more about Gina. She admitted she'd struggled after law school, passing the bar on her second try, and getting work at the new resort near Crystal River. This case with me was her first major criminal investigation. Gina's personal life, she told me, was pretty quiet. She mentioned a boyfriend she hadn't seen in months, and that she led a mostly solitary life in Citrus County. Despite her youthful appearance and her modest legal background, her determination and persistence had uncovered the evidence that might finally clear my name. After dinner, I planned to head back to Orlando, but Gina surprised me by inviting me over for coffee. During a quick tour of her place, I noticed how simple it was, and when we reached her bedroom, I couldn't help but notice the teddy bear on her bed. As I turned to leave, Gina stopped me. Her voice was soft but firm. I think you should fire me. Shocked, I hesitated. What do you mean? Why would I do that? Gina leaned in, her face inches from mine. Because it would breach legal ethics otherwise, she whispered before kissing me passionately. Although I was tempted, I pulled back for a moment. What about your boyfriend? He's barely in the picture anymore, she reassured me. I really want this. After catching our breath, I expressed my concerns about protection, but she reassured me she was on the pill. We shared another kiss, and the tension between us finally gave way. Later that night, she shyly asked if we could repeat the experience, this time at a slower pace. I obliged, but soon enough, her urgency took over, and we found ourselves tangled up again. The next morning, Gina was cheerful, dancing around the kitchen as we had breakfast. She seemed guilt-free about our night together, and though I was relieved, a part of me still felt unsettled. At breakfast, she asked, how does it feel to finally be free of suspicion? But despite the newfound evidence, something still nagged at me. I wasn't fully convinced it was all over. Sheriff McGee had been so certain there was more to the explosion. I wondered if he knew something we didn't. Despite Gina's reassurances that it had all been a tragic accident, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more beneath the surface. Brad Thompson had a lot to gain from this, I said, thinking out loud. His alibi was just too perfect. Gina sighed, 
clearly thinking I was overreacting. Jack, you're being paranoid, she said. But fine, if it'll give you peace of mind, let's go check his office. We drove to Brad's office building, a modest two-story structure with a long hallway connecting the front and back entrances. When we arrived, the security guard offered to show us inside. Brad's office was simple, but something about the space caught my eye. There was a floor-to-ceiling window with a small decal I recognized. It was a pivot design that I knew well from construction work. Curiosity peaked. I asked Gina for her nail clippers and used them to open a hidden slot in the frame. The window pivoted open, revealing an easy escape route without needing to use the hallway. Gina stared at me, astonished. Jack, this doesn't prove anything, she warned. You can't go accusing Brad without solid evidence. The sheriff didn't arrest you because there wasn't enough proof, and the same goes for Brad. I closed the window and took a deep breath, realizing she was right. It would be foolish to make wild accusations without anything concrete. Still, something didn't sit right with me. Let it go, Gina urged gently. Don's not here anymore anyway. He left town, supposedly indefinitely. Just focus on your life. Go back to Orlando and try to move on. I felt frustrated, believing Brad was hiding something. But Gina insisted that pursuing it would only make me look worse. She expressed genuine concern for me, warning that obsessing over conspiracy theories would do me no good. As I drove back to Orlando, I couldn't stop thinking about all the strange coincidences. The perfect alibi, the gas cans, and Mia's behavior. It all felt too convenient. I wondered if I was overthinking everything, or if there really was more to the story. Maybe I should move on, but a part of me refused to let go. I threw myself into work, trying to distract myself. The busy week helped keep my mind off things, but by Thursday afternoon, I found myself once again dwelling on the details. I was caught off guard when Gina unexpectedly walked into my office, this time dressed nicely and holding a bottle of champagne. Celebrating something? I asked, surprised. She smiled. The sheriff's investigation is officially closed. They've ruled the explosion an accident. I thanked her for everything she'd done, but I sensed there was more on her mind. Gina's smile faded slightly. I'm not in love with you, Jack, she admitted. But we've shared some intense experiences, grief, loneliness, and desire. Maybe we could just help each other through it for now. I couldn't deny that I felt the same way. I invited Gina to dinner at my place, and her warm smile in response made me glad I had extended the offer. After we finished our time together in bed, Gina grew more serious and revealed something that immediately piqued my interest. She might know where Brad Thompson had gone. She had seen a package with his name at the resort's office, addressed to Lake Tahoe, and had written it down. Not only that, but she'd learned that Brad's business had significant investments in the Paradiso Resort. I stood up, getting dressed as my determination solidified. I was going to Lake Tahoe to find Brad and get to the bottom of all this. You're not going alone, Gina insisted, wanting to come with me, but I shook my head. It's too dangerous. I need to do this by myself. Reluctantly, she agreed to stay behind. After making arrangements at my office, I booked a flight to Reno, Nevada. But my plans hit a snag as soon as I arrived. An early snowstorm blanketed the area. As a lifelong Floridian, snow wasn't exactly my comfort zone. Still, I wasn't going to let it stop me. I rented a four-wheel drive vehicle and picked up tire chains at the airport, deciding to spend the night in Reno before tackling the icy roads the next day. The drive to Lake Tahoe the following morning was treacherous. Snow fell heavily as I wound my way through the mountains on I-580 in Nevada Route 431. By the time I reached South Lake Tahoe in the afternoon, I was exhausted but relieved to have made it safely. I checked into a hotel near the casino taking a moment to rest before heading out to track down Brad. That evening, after grabbing a burger and beer at the hotel bar while watching the Miami game, I felt a small surge of hope. The game lifted my spirits briefly, but reality hit when I ventured into the casino to clear my head and spotted Brad Thompson at a blackjack table. He was laughing, clearly enjoying himself, with a tall blonde woman by his side. I didn't confront him. Instead, I decided to wait for the right moment heading back to my hotel to plan my next move. Sleep eluded me, though. I lay in bed, tossing and turning, haunted by what I might uncover the next day. By morning, 
I was ready. Dressed in the skiing gear I had bought in Reno, I braced myself for the cold and snow. I even bought a gun from a local dealer, paying extra to bypass the waiting period. As I checked out of the hotel, the storm was still raging, and my mood darkened with the weather. I drove cautiously back toward Brad's chalet, parking my SUV out of sight. The smoke curling from his chimney confirmed he was still there. Climbing up the snowy hill toward the house was exhausting. My breath came out in gasps as I crouched behind some trees, surveying the property. Using my construction knowledge, I quickly disabled his security system with a pry bar and screwdriver and slipped in through a guest bedroom window. The thick carpet muffled my steps as I moved down the hallway. At the far end, I saw Brad sitting at the dining table, absorbed in some paperwork. As soon as I stepped into the main room, though, the creak of a floorboard betrayed me. Brad's head snapped up, and he immediately jumped to his feet. I pointed the tool in my hand toward him, trying to appear more threatening than I felt. Stay where you are, Brad. As I approached, his expression shifted from surprise to smug amusement. Well, well, Jack Turner. What brings you all the way out here? I didn't waste time. Drop the act, Brad. I know you were behind the boat explosion, and I know exactly how you did it. He raised an eyebrow, but I could see a flicker of unease behind his calm demeanor. The conference call? Easy cover, I continued, pressing forward. A cell phone and a bit of trickery were all you needed. I visited your office and saw those pivot windows. You could have slipped out without anyone noticing. His smirk wavered slightly, and I could tell I was getting to him. You got to the boat using a motorboat or a jet ski, didn't you? I guessed. Then you staged the explosion and came back like nothing happened. Brad's arrogant grin returned. It was a ski do, actually. Faster and easier to hide. And with a wet suit on, no one recognized me. I felt my blood boil. Why, Brad? Why go through all of this? You were already rich. How much more did you need? His face darkened, anger replacing his smirk. That's where you're wrong, Turner. All the money was in Mia's name. She made sure of that. A prenup kept me on a leash. I wanted her gone just as much as I wanted the money. I was about to speak when I felt cold steel press against the back of my neck. My heart dropped. You'll live longer if you drop that, a voice whispered in my ear. Despair washed over me as I slowly set the tool down and kicked it away, just as instructed. I looked toward Brad, who was grinning wider than ever. The gunman circled around me and moved next to him, revealing long blonde hair. How could I have been so stupid? I muttered under my breath. I had never even considered that the blonde woman might still be in the picture. Brad nudged her playfully. Go on, show him. She touched her hair, adjusting it slightly before pulling off the blonde wig to reveal a short, dark pixie cut. My world shattered. Emily? I gasped, almost collapsing in disbelief. She smirked at me, a glint of satisfaction in her eyes. See, Brad? I told you the disguise would work. I couldn't comprehend it. You, you were in on this? The whole time? She gave me a look of smug superiority. Who do you think slipped that double dose of Ambien into your breakfast on Sunday? Who do you think bumped up the life insurance to make it look like you had a motive? And who do you think drugged Mia to keep her from causing trouble on the boat? Brad laughed, finally letting the mask drop. It was all so simple, Jack. By the time I reached the yacht, Mia was already unconscious, so it was easy to weigh her down and throw her overboard, Brad said with chilling calmness. Then I rigged the engine, and Emily and I made our escape. I dropped her off at a hidden cove where we had a car waiting. Then I returned to Crystal River and slipped back into the building unnoticed. The explosion covered up the missing women, and all the evidence pointed straight at you, Jack. My mind struggled to process what I was hearing. So, all of this was planned from the start? I stammered, trying to piece together their words. Oh yes, my dear husband, Emily interjected, her voice dripping with malice. Brad and I fell in love soon after I started managing PR for the Paradiso. When he told me about his frustrations with Mia, we began looking for ways to get rid of her. We decided that a boating accident was the perfect way to get rid of her and let me disappear at the same time. She smirked, clearly enjoying my horror. Getting you to that resort was my idea. That sneak preview? The perfect opportunity to execute everything. 
I could barely believe what I was hearing. But why, Emily? Why would you do this to me? I thought we were happy. You were so loving at the resort. How could you betray me like this? Her face twisted with fury, her voice rising. Happy? You thought we were happy, she screamed. I told you I would never be poor again. After everything I went through growing up, do you think I'd ever let myself be vulnerable again? I'll never go back to that. I stumbled backward, overwhelmed by the intensity of her anger. I hadn't realized how deeply her past had scarred her. After a moment, Emily's expression shifted back to a cold calm, and she moved closer to Brad, slipping her arm around him. But now, with Mia gone and everyone believing I'm dead, Brad and I can live the life we deserve. We'll never have to worry about money again. I love him, Jack. We'll be together forever. No, came a voice from the hallway. I turned, shocked, to see Gina standing there, her face pale but determined. Dressed in her pink snowsuit, she looked almost childlike, but the gun she held was unmistakably real. Emily's gun wavered between me and Gina, as if she couldn't decide which of us was the greater threat. Tears streamed down Gina's face as she shouted, It's not true. Brad loves me. He promised he was going to leave Mia for me. I blinked in disbelief. Brad was your boyfriend? But Gina's focus was solely on Brad. You told me you loved me, she sobbed, her voice cracking. You promised we'd be together. Brad's smirk returned, his voice oozing with disdain. Did I? Gina, I was just being charming. Men say whatever they need to say to get what they want. He shrugged casually. Sure. I enjoyed our little affair, but I was only interested in your legal skills. Or rather, your lack of them. I made sure no other lawyer would take Andy's case, knowing you'd screw it up. Gina's heartbreak quickly turned into rage. Don't call me a little girl, she screamed, and in her fury, her finger jerked the trigger. A gunshot echoed through the room. I watched in stunned horror as Brad clutched his chest, a red stain blooming across his shirt. His knees buckled and he collapsed face-first onto the floor. Emily screamed and fired her gun wildly. The first shot hit Gina in the shoulder, spinning her around. The second bullet struck her in the back, and she crumpled to the ground, unmoving. Realizing this was my only chance, I rushed toward Emily. She fired again, but I was already diving forward in a soccer-style tackle. My boots slammed into her knee, and she let out a scream of pain as she tumbled to the floor. Her head hit the ground with a sickening thud, leaving her dazed. I scrambled to my feet and kicked the gun away from her, making sure she couldn't reach it. Emily groaned, clutching her leg, the awkward angle of her knee suggesting a serious injury, likely torn ligaments. She wouldn't be moving anytime soon. I hurried to Gina's side, checking for a pulse. My heart sank as I found nothing. Her body lay still, lifeless. Poor Gina, I whispered. She had been used by Brad just like the rest of us. Turning back to Emily, I saw her struggling, tears streaming down her face. Jack, she whimpered. Help me, please. I looked down at her, feeling a mix of pity and disgust. I pulled my leg from her grasp and reached for my phone. I dialed 911, my voice steady despite the chaos. There's been a double homicide. I need police and an ambulance at this address. I'll be here to let them in, I said before hanging up. I moved to the window, staring out at the falling snow, the peaceful scene at odds with everything that had just happened. Reaching into my jacket pocket, I pulled out the miniature audio recorder I'd taken with me. I pressed play, listening briefly to ensure it had captured everything. It had. Every damning word was there. I set the recorder on the table for the police and glanced back at Emily. She lay on the floor sobbing in pain, clutching her injured knee. In another life, I might have helped her, just like we iced knees during our soccer games. But not this time. I left her to cry, knowing that help would be arriving soon, but not from me.